Chapter Six of the Forgotten Planet by Murray Leinster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Red Dust. It was very fortunate indeed that the feast took place when it did. Two days later, it would probably have been impossible, and three days later, it would have been too late to do any good. But coming when it did, it made the difference, which was all the difference in the world. Only thirty hours after the feasting, which followed the death of the Clotho Spider, Burl's fellows, from John to Dor to Tet, and Dirk and Saya, had come to know a numb despair, which the other creatures of his world were simply a bit too stupid to achieve. It was night. There was darkness all over the lowlands, and over all the area of perhaps a hundred square miles which the humans of Burl's acquaintance really knew. He alone of his tribe had been as much as forty miles from the foraging ground over which they wandered. At any given time, the tribe clung together for comfort, venturing only as far as was necessary to find food. Although the planet possessed continents, they knew less than a good-sized county of it. The planet owned oceans and they knew only small brooks, and one river, where they knew it, was assuredly less than two hundred yards across. And they faced stark disaster that was not strictly a local one, but beyond their experience, and hopelessly beyond their ability to face. They were superior to the insects about them only in the fact they realized what was threatening them. The disaster was the red puffballs. But it was night. The soft, blanketing darkness of a cloud-wrapped world lay all about. Burl sat awake, wrapped in his magnificent velvet cloak, his spear beside him, and the yard-long golden plumes of the moth's antenna bound to his forehead for a headdress. About him and his tribesmen were the swollen shapes of fungi, hiding the few things that could be seen in darkness. From the low-hanging clouds the nightly rain dripped down. Now a drop, and then another drop. Slowly, deliberately, persistently, moisture fell from the skies. There were other sounds. Things flew through the blackness overhead. Moths with mighty wing-beats that sometimes sent rhythmic winds stirring down to the tribe in its hiding place. There were deep pulsations of sound made by night beetles aloft. There were the harsh noises of grasshoppers. They were rare, senselessly advertising their existence to nearby predators. Not too far from where Burl brooded came bright chirrupings, where relatively small beetles roamed among the mushroom forests, singing cheerfully in deep bass voices. They were searching for the underground tidbits which took the place of truffles their ancestors had lived on back on Earth. All seemed to be as it had been since the first humans were cast away upon this planet, and at night, indeed, the new danger subsided. The red puffballs did not burst after sunset. Burl stayed awake, brooding in a new sort of frustration. He and all his tribe were plainly doomed. Yet Burl had experienced too many satisfying sensations lately to be willing to accept the fact. The new red growths were everywhere. Months ago, a storm wind blew, while somewhere, not too far distant, the other red puffballs were bursting and sending their spores into the air. Since it was only a wind storm, there was no rain to wash the air clean of the lethal dust. The new kind of puffball, but perhaps it was not new, it could have thriven for thousands of years where it was first thrown as a spore from a genetically unstable parent, the new kind of puffball would not normally be spread in this fashion. By chance, it had. There were dozens of the things within a quarter mile, hundreds within a mile, and thousands upon thousands within the area the tribe normally foraged in. Burl had seen them even forty miles away, as yet immature. They would be deadly at one period alone, the time of their bursting. 
but there were limitations even to the deadliness of the red puffballs, though Burl had not yet discovered the fact. But as of now, they doomed the tribe. One woman panted and moaned in her exhausted sleep, a little way away from where Burl tried to solve the problem presented by the tribe. Nobody else attempted to think it out. The others accepted doom with fatalistic hopelessness. Burl's leadership might mean extra food, but nothing could counter the doom awaiting them. So their thoughts seemed to run. But Burl doggedly reviewed the facts in the darkness. While the humans about him slept, the sleep of those without hope and even without rebellion, there had been many burstings of the crimson puffballs, as many as four or five of the deadly dust clouds had been seen sprouting into the air at the same time. A small boy of the tribe had breathlessly told of seeing a hunting spider killed by the red dust. Lana, the half-grown girl, had come upon one of the gigantic rhinoceros beetles belly up on the ground, already the prey of ants. She had snatched a huge, meat-filled joint and run away, faster than the ants could follow. A far-ranging man had seen a butterfly with wings ten yards across die in a dust cloud. Another woman, Corey, had been nearby when a red cloud settled slowly over long, solid lines of black worker ants bound on some unknown mission. Later, she saw other workers carrying the dead bodies back to the ant city to be used for food. Burl still sat wakeful and frustrated and enraged as the slow rain fell upon the toadstools that formed the tribe's lurking place. He doggedly went over and over the problem. There were innumerable red puffballs. Some had burst. The others undoubtedly would burst. Anything that breathed the red dust died. With thousands of the puffballs around them, it was unthinkable that any human in this place could escape breathing the red dust and dying. But it had not always been so. There had been a time when there were no red puffballs here. Burl's eyes moved restlessly over the sleeping forms limbed by a patch of foxfire. The feathery plumes rising from his head were outlined softly by the phosphorescence. His face was lined with a frown as he tried to think his own and his fellows way out of the predicament. Without realizing it, Burl had taken it upon himself to think for his tribe. He had no reason to. It was simply a natural thing for him to do so, now that he had learned to think, even though his efforts were crude and painful as yet. Saya woke with a start and stared about. There had been no alarm, merely the usual noises of distant murders and the songs of singers in the night. Burl moved restlessly. Saya stood up quietly, her long hair flowing about her. Sleepy-eyed, she moved to be near Burl. She sank to the ground beside him, sitting up, because the hiding place was crowded and small, and dozed fitfully. Presently, her head drooped to one side. It rested against his shoulder. She slept again. This simple act may have been the catalyst which gave Burl the solution to the problem. Some few days before, Burl had been in a faraway place where there was much food. At that time, he thought vaguely of finding Saya and bringing her to that place. He remembered now that the red puffballs flourished there as well as here. But there had been other dangers in between, so the only half-formed purpose had been abandoned. Now, though with Saya's head resting against his shoulder, he remembered the plan, and then the stroke of genius took place. He formed the idea of a journey, which was not a going after food. This present dwelling place of the tribe had been free of red puffballs until only recently. There must be other places where there were no red puffballs. He would take Saya and his tribesmen to such a place. 
It was really genius. The people of Burl's tribe had no purposes, only needs, for food and the like. Burl had achieved abstract thought, which previously had not been useful on the forgotten planet and therefore not practiced. But it was time for humankind to take a more fitting place in the unbalanced ecological system of this nightmare world. Time to change that unbalance in favor of humans. When dawn came, Burl had not slept at all. He was all authority and decision. He had made plans. He spoke sternly, loudly, which frightened the people, conditioned to be furtive, holding up his spear as he issued commands. His timid tribe folk obeyed him meekly. They felt no loyalty to him or confidence in his decisions yet, but they were beginning to associate obedience to him with good things, food for one. Before the day fully came, they made loads of the remaining edible mushrooms and uneaten meat. It was remarkable for humans to leave their hiding place while they still had food to eat, but Burl was implacable and scowling. Three men bore spears at Burl's urging. He brandished his long shaft confidently as he persuaded the other three to carry clubs. They did so reluctantly, even though previously they had killed ants with clubs. Spears, they felt, would have been better. They wouldn't be so close to the prey then. The sky became gray over all its expanse. The indefinite bright area which marked the position of the sun became established. It was part way toward the center of the sky when the journey began. Burl had, of course, no determined course, only a destination, safety. He had been carried south in his misadventure on the river. There were red puffballs to the southward, therefore he ruled out that direction. He could have chosen the east and come upon an ocean, but no safety from the red spore dust. Or he could have chosen the north. It was pure chance that he headed west. He walked confidently through the gruesome world of the lowlands, holding his spear in a semblance of readiness. Clad as he was, he made a figure at once valiant and rather pathetic. It was not too sensible for one young man, even one who had killed two spiders, to essay leading a tiny tribe of fearful folk across a land of monstrous ferocity and incredible malignance, armed only with a spear from a dead insect's armor. It was absurd to dress up for the enterprise in a velvety cloak made from a moth's wing blue moth fur for a loincloth, and merely beautiful golden plumes bobbing above his forehead. Probably, though, that gorgeousness had a good effect upon his followers. They surely could not reassure each other by their numbers. There was a woman with a baby in her arms, Cory, three children of nine or ten, unable to resist the instinct to play even on so perilous a journey ate almost constantly of the lumps of foodstuff they had been ordered to carry. After them came Dick, a long-legged adolescence boy, with eyes that roved anxiously about. Behind him were two men, Dor with a short spear and Jack hefting a club, both of them badly frightened at the idea of fleeing from dangers they knew and were terrified by, to other dangers unknown, and, consequently, more to be feared. The others trailed after them. Tet was rear guard. Burl had separated the pair of boys to make them useful. Together, they were worthless. It was a pathetic caravan, in a way. In all the rest of the galaxy, man was the dominant creature. There was no other planet, from one rim to the other, where men did not build their cities or settlements with unconscious arrogance, completely disregarding the wishes of lesser things. Only on this planet did men hide from danger rather than destroy it. Only here could men be driven from their place by lower life forms. And only here would a migration be made on foot, with men's eyes fearful 
their bodies poised to flee at sight of something stronger and more deadly than themselves. They marched, straggling a little, with many waverings aside from a fixed line. Once Dick saw the trap door of a trapdoor spider's lair. They halted, trembling, and went a long way out of their intended path to avoid it. Once they saw a great praying mantis, a good half-mile off, and again they deviated from their proper route. Near midday their way was blocked. As they moved onward, a great, high-pitched sound could be heard ahead of them. Burl stopped. His face grew pinched. But it was only a stridulation, not the cries of creatures being devoured. It was a horde of ants by the thousands and hundreds of thousands and nothing else. Burl went ahead to scout, and he did it because he did not trust anybody else to have the courage or intelligence to return with a report, instead of simply running away if the news were bad. But it happened to be a sort of action which would help to establish his position as leader of his tribe. Burl moved forward cautiously and presently came to an elevation from which he could see the cause of the tremendous waves of sound that spread out in all directions from the level plain before him. He waved to his followers to join him, and stood looking down at the extraordinary sight. When they reached his side, and Saya was first, the spectacle had not diminished. For quite half a mile in either direction, the earth was black with ants. It was a battle of opposing armies from rival ant cities. They snapped and bit at each other. Locked in vice-like embraces, they rolled over and over upon the ground, trampled underfoot by hordes of their fellows who surged over them to engage in equally suicidal combat. There was, of course, no thought of surrender or of quarter. They fought by thousands of pairs, their jaws seeking to crush each other's armor, snapping at each other's antenna, biting at each other's eyes. The noise was not like that of army ants. This was the agonizing sound of ants being dismembered while still alive. Some of the creatures had only one or two or three legs left, yet struggled fiercely to entangle another enemy before they died. They were mad cripples, fighting insanely with head and thorax only, their abdomens sheared away. The whining battle cry of the multitude made a deafening uproar. From either side of the battleground, a wide path led back toward separate ant cities, which were invisible from Burl's position. These highways were marked by hurrying groups of ants, reinforcements rushing to the fight. Compared to the other creatures of this world, the ants were small, but no lumbering beetle dared to march insolently in their way, nor did any carnivores try to prey upon them. They were dangerous. Burl and his tribe folk were the only living things remaining near the battlefield, with one single exception. The exception was itself a tribe of ants, vastly less in number than the fighting creatures, and greatly smaller in size as well. Where the combatants were from a foot to fourteen inches long, these gorilla ants were no more than the third of a foot in length. They hovered industriously at the edge of the fighting, not as allies to either nation, but strictly on their own account. Scurrying among the larger fighting ants with marvelous agility, they carried off piecemeal the body of the dead and valiantly slew the more gravely wounded for the same purpose. They swarmed over the fighting ground whenever the tide of battle receded, caring nothing for the origin of the quarrel and espousing neither side. These opportunists busily salvaged the dead and still living debris of the battle for their own purposes. Burl and his followers were forced to make a two-mile detour to avoid the battle. The passage between bodies of scurrying reinforcements was a matter of some difficulty. Burl hurried the others past a route to the front. 
reeking of formic acid, over which endless regiments and companies of ants moved frantically to join in the fight. They were intensely excited, Antanna waving wildly. They rushed to the front and instantly flung themselves into the fray, becoming lost and indistinguishable in the black mass of fighting creatures. The humans passed precariously between two hurrying battalions, Dick and Tet, pausing briefly to burden themselves with prey, and hurried on to leave as many miles as possible behind them before nightfall. They never knew any more about the battle. It could have started over anything at all. Two ants from different cities may have disputed some tiny bit of carrion and soon been reinforced by companions until the military might of both cities was engaged. Once it had started, of course, the fighters knew whom to fight, if not why they did so. The inhabitants of the two cities had different smells, which served them as uniforms. But the outcome of the war would hardly matter. Not to the fighters, certainly. There were many red mushrooms in this area. If either of the cities survived at all, it would be because its nursery workers lived upon stored food, as they tended the grubs until the time of sprouting red dust had ended. Burl's folk saw many of the red puffballs burst during the day. More than once, they came upon empty, flaccid, parchment sacks. More often still, they came upon red puffballs, not yet quite ready to emit their murderous seed. That first night, the tribe hid among the bases of giant puffballs of a more familiar sort. When touched, they would shoot out a puff of white powder resembling smoke. The powder was harmless, fortunately, and the tribe knew that fact. Although not toxic, the white powder was identical in every other way to the terrible red dust from which the tribe fled. That night, Burl slept soundly. He had been without rest for two days and a night, and he was experienced in journeying to remote places. He knew that there were no more dangerous than familiar ones. But the rest of the tribe, and even Saya, were fearful and terrified. They waited timorously all through the dark hours for menacing sounds to crash suddenly through the steady dripping of the nightly rain around them. The second day's journey was not unlike the first. The following day they came upon a full ten-acre patch of giant cabbages bigger than a family dwelling. Something in the soil, perhaps, favored vegetation over fungi. The dozens of monstrous vegetables were the setting for riotous life. Great slugs ate endlessly of the huge green leaves, and things preyed on them. Bees came droning to gather the pollen of the flowers, and other things came to prey on the predators in their turn. There was one great cabbage somewhat separate from the rest. After a long examination of the scene, Burl daringly led quaking John and Jack to the attack. Dor splendidly attacked elsewhere alone. When the tribe moved on, there was much meat, and everyone, even the children, wore lion cloths of incredibly luxurious fur. There were perils, too. On the fifth day of the tribe's journey, Burl suddenly froze into stillness. One of the hairy tarantulas which lived in burrows with a concealed trap door at ground level had fallen upon a scaribus beetle and was devouring it only a hundred yards ahead. The tribe folk trembled as Burl led them silently back and around by a safe detour. But all these experiences were beginning to have an effect. It was becoming a matter of course that Burl should give orders which others should obey. It was even becoming matter of fact that the possession of food was not a beautiful excuse to hide from all danger, eating and dozing until all the food was gone. Very gradually, the tribe was developing the notion that the purpose of existence was not solely to escape awareness of peril, 
but to foresee and avoid it. They had no clear-cut notion of purpose as yet. They were simply outgrowing purposelessness. After a time, they even looked about them with dim stirrings of an attitude other than a desperate alertness for danger. Humans from any other planet, surely, would have been astounded at the vistas of golden mushrooms stretching out in forests on either hand and the plains with flaking surfaces given every imaginable color by the molds and rusts and tiny flowering yeasts growing upon them. They would have been amazed by the turgid pools the journeying tribes came upon, where the water was concealed by a thick layer of slime through which enormous bubbles of foul-smelling gas rose to enlarge to preposterous size before bursting abruptly. Had they been as ill-armed as Burl's folk, though, visitors from other planets would have been at least as timorous. Lacking highly specialized knowledge of the ways of insects on this world, even well-armed visitors would have been in greater danger. But the tribe went on without a single casualty. They had fleeting glimpses of the white spokes of symmetrical spider webs, whose least thread no member of the tribe could break. Their immunity from disaster, though in the midst of danger, gave them a certain all too human concentration upon discomfort. Lacking calamities, they noticed their discomforts and grew weary of continual traveling. A few of the men complained to Burl. For answer, he pointed back along the way they had come. To the right, a reddish dust cloud was just settling, and to the rear rose another as they looked. And on this day a thing happened which at once gave the complainers the rest they asked for, and proved the fatality of remaining where they were. A child ran aside from the path its elders were following. The ground here had taken on a brownish hue. As the child stirred up the surface mold with his feet, dust that had settled was raised up again. It was far too thin to have any visible color. But the child suddenly screamed, strangling. The mother ran frantically to snatch him up. The red dust was no less deadly merely because it had settled to the ground. If a storm wind came now, but they were infrequent under the forgotten planet's heavy bank of clouds, the fallen red dust could be raised up again and scattered about until there would be no living thing anywhere which would not gasp and writhe and die. But the child would not die. He would suffer terribly and be weak for days. In the morning he could be carried. When night began to darken the sky, the tribe searched for a hiding place. They came upon a shelf-like cliff, perhaps twenty or thirty feet high, slanting toward the line of the tribesmen's travel. Burl saw black spots in it, openings, burrows. He watched them as the tribe drew near. No bees or wasps went in or out. He watched long enough to be sure. When they were close, he was certain, ordering the others to wait he went forward to make doubly sure. The appearance of the holes reassured him. Dug months before by mining bees, gone or dead now, the entrance to the burrows were weathered and bedraggled. Burl explored, first sniffing carefully at each opening. They were empty. This would be shelter for the night. He called his followers, and they crawled into the three-foot tunnels to hide. Burl stationed himself near the outer edge of one of them to watch for signs of danger. Night had not quite fallen. John and Dor, hungry, went off the forge a little way beyond the cliff. They would be cautious and timid, taking no risks whatever. Burl waited for the return of his explorers. Meanwhile, he fretted over the meaning of the stricken child. Stirred up red dust was dangerous. The only time when there would be no peril from it, would be at night, when the dripping rainfall of the dark hours turned the surface of this world into thin shine. It occurred to Burl that it would be safe to travel at night, 
so far as the red dust was concerned. He rejected the idea instantly. It was unthinkable to travel at night for innumerable other reasons. Frowning, he poked his spear idly at a tumbled mass of tiny parchment cup-like things near the entrance of the cave. And instantly movement became visible. Fifty, sixty, a hundred infinitesimal creatures, no more than half an inch in length, made haste to hide themselves among the thimble-sized paper-like cups. They moved with extraordinary clumsiness and immense effort, seemingly only by contortions of their greenish-black bodies. Burl had never seen any creature progress in such a slow and ineffective fashion. He drew one of the small creatures back with the point of his spear and examined it from a safe distance. He picked it up on his spear and brought it close to his eyes. The thing redoubled its frenzied movements. It slipped off the spear and plopped upon the soft moth fur he wore about his middle. Instantly, as if it were a conjuring trick, the insect vanished. Burl searched for minutes before he found it hidden deep in the long, soft hairs of his garment, resting motionless and seemingly at ease. It was the larval form of a beetle, fragments of whose armor could be seen near the base of the clay cliffside. Hidden in the remnants of its egg casings, the brood of minute things had waited near the opening of the mining bee tunnel. It was their gamble with destiny when mining bee grubs had slept through metamorphoses and come uncertainly out of the tunnel for the first time, that some or many of the larvae might snatch the instant's chance to fasten to the bee's legs and writhe upward to an anchorage in their fur. It happened that this particular batch of eggs had been laid after the emergence of the grubs. They had no possible chance of fulfilling their intended role as parasites on the insects of the order Hymenoptera. They were simply and matter-of-factly doomed by the blindness of instinct, which had caused them to be placed where they could not possibly survive. On the other hand, if one or many of them found a lurking place, the offspring of their host would have been doomed. The place filled by oil beetle larvae in the schemes of things is the place, or one of the places, reserved for creatures that limit the number of mining bees. When a bee louse infested mining bee has made a new tunnel, stocked it with honey for its young, and then laid one egg to float on the pool of nourishment and hatch and feed and ultimately grow to another mining beetle, at that moment of egg-laying, one small bee-louse detaches itself. It remains zestfully in the provision cell to devour the egg for which the provisions were accumulated. It happily consumes those provisions, and in time, an oil beetle crawls out of the tunnel, a mining bee so laboriously prepared. Burl had no difficulty in detaching the small insect and casting it away but in doing so he discovered that others had hidden themselves in his fur without his knowledge. He plucked them away and found more. While savages can be highly tolerant of vermin, too small to be seen, they feel a peculiar revolt against serving as host to creatures of sensible size. Burl reacted violently, as once he had reacted to the discovery of a leech clinging to his heel. He jerked off his loincloth and beat it savagely with his spear. When it was clean, he still felt a wholly unreasonable sense of humiliation. It was not clearly thought out, of course. Burl feared huge insects too much to hate them. But that small creatures should fasten upon him produced a completely irrational feeling of outrage. For the first time in very many years or centuries, a human being on the forgotten planet felt that he had been insulted. His dignity had been assailed. Burl raged. But as he raged, a triumphant shout 
came from nearby. John and Dor were returning from their foraging, loaded down with edible mushrooms. They also had taken a step upward toward the natural dignity of men. They had so far forgotten their terror as to shout in exultation at their find of food. Up till now, Burl had been the only man daring to shout. Now there were two others. In his overwrought state, this was also enraging. The result of hurt vanity on two counts was jealousy, and the result of jealousy was a crazy foolhardiness. Burl ground his teeth and insanely resolved to do something so magnificent, so tremendous, so utterly breathtaking, that there could be no possible imitation by anybody else. His thinking was not especially clear. Part of his motivation had been provided by the oil beetle larvae. He glared about him at the deepening dusk, seeking some exploit, some glamorous feat, to perform immediately, even in the night. He found one. End of Chapter 6